so wonderful to see you all. I think we can go ahead and start, I believe. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start. You've, you've been here. I saw some of your beautiful faces before. So we're going to have three different presentations today, Strategies for the Use of Gender Inclusive Language in Portuguese Language Pedagogy by Carlos Villa. We have Advocating for and Implementing Gender Just Pedagogy Within and Beyond the Italian Classroom, Case Studies from Australia, Ricardo Amorati and Elena Provano, and Challenges Challenging Frameworks with Teaching Gender Inclusive English in France by Veronique Perry. So I'm going to give the floor to you, Carlos, please go ahead and enlighten us. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Carlos Pio. I um I teach um sorry, I teach Spanish and Portuguese, um, language literature, um and uh business in Portuguese for the professions at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, uh in Philadelphia. And so uh I am going to start. And I'm going to, before I start, I would like to talk about some breakthrough moments in the history of LGTB folks in the Portuguese speaking countries. Um, in this, uh, some of these moments triggered and promoted a lot of more acceptance and opening um, of LGTB people, but it does not mean that they are totally accepted socially or culturally. Uh, wait a second, please. I don't know what I'm doing. Ah, yes, okay. So, apologize. Okay, so Portugal, Portugal, 2010, the legalization of same-sex same marriage, marriage, Brazil, 2000, followed by Brazil in 2013. Then in Angola, we had recently the decriminalization of same-sex uh, conduct and the ban of, um, I cannot read, I apologize. I have to move this to here, yes, sorry. Um, yes, the ban of employment, um, I have to move this again, I apologize, it was the bar, yes, um, the, the ban of, uh, employment discrimination on the basis of, uh, se uh sexual orientation, but same-sex, uh, marriage is not legal, Portugal, Portugal, two, two, 2023, uh, the prohibition of conversion therapies, then in Brazil in the same year, the inclusion of intersex category in the CPF card, which would be the equivalent as a U.S. social security card, and then in Brazil, and I have to move again my, um, bar, Okay. Um, the gender affirming surgery for trans men is covered today uh, uh, in Brazil by the national health system. Um, when it when it comes to, when it comes to the language inclusion uh, with the inclusion of neutral language or the um, um, gender inclusive language. In the classroom, uh, one of the most one of the most important things is to learn basic specific vocabulary to the LGTB uh, specific to the LGTB community in Portuguese. For example, instead of using the doubling, which is using the todos and todas, which means everyone, todos it's uh, uh, the gender marker is an O, todas is an uh, uh, masculine A. So instead of that, we could normalize non-binary endings, for example, normalize neutral collective nouns, uh, also to normalize neutral and universal feminine in, uh, in, uh, 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 words in exams. Um, and other graded exercises, make sure not to use only male point of views, also normalize personal pronouns, which uh, uh, are non-binary pronouns, then to normalize possessive pronouns and normalize other terminology and vocabulary in Portuguese, like for example, transgender person, trans, travesti, transsexual, non-binary, queer, with its orthographic variations. Uh, also become familiar with support services of interest to students within your own university or community and establish connections between the content of your class and the students' uh, communities around them. For example, in my case at Penn, uh, to mention some um, um, 
ethnic and racial uh, um, uh, uh, resources, for example, Casa Latina for the Hispanic and Latino, Latinx students, Muslim Students Association, Black Alumni Society, Native American Law Students Association, and for our, our purpose here, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Center, and use the content and resources of the said uh, uh, um, uh, uh, center with the ones taught in class. Uh, now I'm going to go into the resources for uh, strategies for language classes. For example, when it comes to describe one's physical and psychological traits, I do I tend to not to correct the gender agreement in the classroom or in the homework. And by that, it means that I avoid students uh, making assumptions about the student's sexual or gender identities. For example, if a student, for example, if a student that is perceived when I look at, at them as male, for example, if they use the female pronouns, I'm not going to correct them. Uh, so I do, however, make sure that the students understand that Portuguese is a Romance language, which has two markers for the bi uh, binary gender, O for the masculine and, and a, a, a for, uh, for the feminine, this applies to um, Spanish too, and that in a more conservative and hierarchical environment, those two forms are accepted as the form. So I let the students choose from either binary or gender non-conforming pronouns, uh, so it allows them to self-express freely. I only tend to correct the gender agreement for inanimate objects. Like, for example, instead of saying the yellow car, carro amarela, I would say, I would correct to carro amarelo, because O, the, end, the ending is masculine, applies to the car, which is also uh, masculine. Um, also, avoid making assumptions about students and include first-day questionnaires, ask about names to be, or name, to be used in class pronouns, and also anything else that I should know, for example, uh, in the first class of the, uh, in the first uh, uh, set, uh, class, I always uh, uh, hand out a form in which I include the questions, what is your name, what do you study, what are some of your interests, which name and pronouns should be uh, used to address you, and would you like to add any more, any other information about yourself. Also, daily reinforcements of gender inclusive and non-binary uh, pronouns in Portuguese, for example, in structure to students. Uh, always reinforce, for example, if uh, the student, uh, the, stu the instructor will say to the students, someone who identifies as a female in Portuguese, will they say engraçada or engraçado? And students will reply. Or, for example, instru instructor to students, someone who identifies as a non-binary person, will they say engraçado, which ends in an O, which is the, the, the masculine uh, ending, or engraçade, which is the E, which is the, uh, using the E, which is the non-binary uh, um, ending. Also, for example, instead of using A or O endings in Portuguese, what are some pronouns we use to include non-binary or trans people? So this is one of those really daily uh, reinforcements that we can do at every, uh, in the first and second semester. Excuse me. And also, representation and iconography matters in images and input videos. I always try to include a lot of LGTB uh, content and LGTB uh, uh, folks. For example, here, this is an exercise, a, a, a simple exercise about descriptions. And I've, I have included in the middle a transsexual uh, Brazilian person from Brazil, which is Gilberto Salsi Jr. Also, for example, this is an activity about the history afro lusophone uh, uh, history month. And for example, choose from one of these two uh, uh, people, um, which are famous people, known people in Brazil. For example, on the left, Jamila Ribeiro is a thinker uh, uh, from Brazil. And then on the right, Alex Simões, who is, is a LGTB poet from Salvador in Brazil. For example, choose from one of these two uh, people and uh, make a presentation in class about what do they do? Why uh, reasons? Why are they important? Wh why did you uh, choose them? Are there any other uh, people like these in your country or culture that make uh, that do um, that um, uh, make a similar uh, uh, um, activities or initiatives in your country? For example, another exercise is, for example, you arrive to a Lusophone country and you want to meet new people. You have to choose from these apps and you have to set up a profile. This is a really good exercise for people talk about their physical characteristics, um, psychological traits, 
likes and dislikes or interests? What are you studying in terms of university subjects, classes, courses, and what are you looking for on a person in terms of physical and psychological traits? So they can choose from a lot of a uh, good array of uh, um, apps. Also, for example, chapters about clothes use a lot of, uh, I mean, instead of falling on the same cliche of men use pants and women use skirts, uh, try to twist it, uh, it. For example, the case of Billy Porter on the upper right, which um, absolutely uh, challenges uh, traditional clothing. Or, for example, chapter about the family and include a lot of images about non-traditional families. Um, also, for example, for business in Portuguese classes or Portuguese for the professions, use business person or ver its variations, for example, uh, for, uh, for example, business trans person, business career person, business non-binary person, instead of falling on the business woman and businessman. Also, address LGBTQI plus content in uh, human resources forms and public uh, official forms. For example, when we ask questions like, how do you identify? Instead of uh, having only two options as male or female, female and the misuse of gender and sex and sexual orientation challenges offer a solid and sophisticated, sophisticated range of gender categories. For example, here we have a form from uh, Brazil and I only have three options for sex, male, female and non-specified. For example, this is a form uh, from Portugal and here I have two options, male, female for sex. And here, this is another form from uh, Angola. And I have, for example, only two options, male, female, for gender. Also for literature and cinema and culture classes, integrate, we should integrate LGTB scholars and thinkers and LGTB content and perspectives instead of using one LGTB scholar or thinker and tokenizing particular representations of minorities. Uh, also, for example, use in the, when we think about learning outcomes or can-do statements at the end of a class, chapter, middle, uh, or end of the semester, uh, we ask students to reflect on the things that they have learned. For example, I can ask, can I use the present? Can I use the conditional? Can I buy clothes from the store? Can I use my, can I introduce myself? Can I name an Afro-Brazilian woman philosopher? Can I name a queer rapper from Brazil? Can I name, for, can I address trans people using pronouns in Portuguese? Is, which allows people, to, learners, to reflect on the things that they have learned. Also, for example, for Canvas or, or other online platforms, taking into consideration and respect students' privacy and do small review acti activities about LGTB content in a literature or language class or the likes, and post some warm-up or follow-up questions about a topic that has been introduced or will be introduced. For example, questions like, how do you feel around trans people? Do you know any queer people and trans people? Singers, famous people, politicians? What gender-neutral pronouns and non-binary pronouns are you familiar with? In Spanish and Portuguese. Do you know what any fam famous lesbian people? What have you learned so far about gay and non-binary people? Which pronouns you use? Also, uh, for example, I would like now to focus, yes, on the, yes, on the, I apologize, daily challenges. I'm, I'm getting to the end of my presentation. Daily challenges and mishaps which constrict the use of these pedagogies. For example, even though there is a lot of pushback to gender inclusive language from many circles of power, for example, in Spanish, the uh, La RAE, uh, which is the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language, does not accept gender inclusive language in Spanish as correct. Um, which is, and it's actually used within certain Spanish and Portuguese language spe speaking communities around the world. Also, for example, cis people and anyone who are not familiar or are skeptic of using gender inclusive language, also workers, staff, students, uh, faculty, also family and friends who resist the use of gender inclusive language. Usually the kind of feedback that I, uh, that I get is, it is too hard. That is only male and female, and that's just normal. Now, I have to know all of, all of these pronouns, or for example, but I've always used these, or for example, I have so much to memorize, or for example, this is a bit extreme, and constantly misgendering uh, others. Also, lack of, lack of LGTB uh, training, lack of, lack of LGTB structures, 
And finally, the use of inclusive language is complex though, taking into consideration the social and cultural pressures that affect and curtail it. On the one hand, the use of inclusive language may overwhelm a student who is in the closet and they might, they might feel a coercion to be outed. So, and on the other hand, it allows them to feel seen and respected and online platforms Canvas, Black, uh, Moodle, or uh, Blackboard may it be extremely useful for self-expression instead of being forced to talk about themselves themselves in front of their colleagues. Um, also, for example, these exercises um, can have extremely meaningful and rich outcomes. I found that students in semester one are extremely silenced, and then in semester two and three tend to open up, self-express using inclusive, inclusive uh, using inclusive, neutral, and non-binary language language and finally outcome to come out uh also yes our goal is to sorry as an example in regards to technological tools discussion discussion boards or um online platforms these are a great tool for addressing complex uh issues like the definition of ethnicity color citizenship gender and sexuality a queer or trans student may encounter difficulties in a classroom whose vast, vast majority is cis so a blog functions as a safe stress-free environment for that student or any other to that choose to express their gender. Also the definition and even the explanation in the classroom of a group other than the majority may cause some confrontation and anxiety. So these blogs can be a, least, a less uh, heated environment for a larger discussion. Finally, our goal is to make learners reflect and become aware of lang inclusive language, train learners to use standard language that neutralizes gender binary distinction. And I believe that this kind of uh, pedagogic pedago pedagogical initiatives will uh, encourage one's choosing uh, and using this language. Um, also, sorry. And also they, um, they probably are, they foster belonging and probably they foster the most beautiful experience, which was the experience that Wes Churning was talking about tomorrow, which uh, today in the morning, which was the gender joy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And also at the end, once we're done with the three presentations, we're going to have 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. So you can unmute yourself and ask, ask questions at the end as well. So we have the, another uh, presentation advocating for and implementing gender just pedagogy within and beyond the Italian classroom, case studies from Australia by Ricardo and Elena. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead and tell uh, us. Thank you so much, uh, Nushin. I'm going to start. Uh, thank you for um, for inviting us, for being uh, here um, for our presentation. Um, we are in Melbourne, Australia, so it's already Saturday morning for us. <laughs> and um, we are really happy to share with you some case studies about gender just pedagogy that we are implementing in our classes. With Ricardo, we teach in the Italian department at the University of Melbourne. And we would like to start by sharing our understanding, our definition of um, in inclusive language. We're gonna share some um, examples from our um, practices and we're going to share with you also a project that we have to include uh, teachers in primary and secondary school that are demanding and requesting some support in addressing uh, language uh, just um, um, tools to uh, teach their students. So what do we mean with language inclusivo? We are all on the same page, I think, in this panel. We, it's a language that is uh, respectful and promotes the value of all people and help us to empower our students, to give them opportunities to express their identity. And we focus particularly on gender identities. But in Italian, we have uh, another option. We can use the expression linguaggio ampio rather than inclusivo. Ampio can be translated into broad. and the is, um emphasizes the opening of uh, opportunities, of options, of linguistic spaces for us and for our students to have more, uh, a range of um, strategies to um, define and express uh, their identity. And so we tend, we prefer to use the term uh, linguaggio ampio. Um, 
what does it mean exactly in the Italian class is something that Ricardo is going to explain uh, for you now. Thank you, Elena. Um, so uh, these are the issues that we have to deal with when we think about linguaggio ampio in Italian. Um, Italian, like Portuguese, uh, is based on a grammatical gender binary. So we have a masculine and a feminine form, and grammatical gender tends to match the gender of human reference. So the word for man in Italian is masculine, the word for woman is feminine, and so on. Uh, this doesn't happen all the time, but it's usually what happens. Um, and gender is also very visible. So we see it in uh, determiners, so adjectives, articles, pronouns, some verb forms, and so on. There are also uh, gender asymmetries uh, in the way the language is used. Uh, in particular, the masculine form is generally used as the generic form for uh, um, when talking about mixed groups, and is often also used uh, as the dominant form for prestigious male-dominated professions. Uh, because of the way the language is used, women and non-binary individuals lack in representation. And this is why there's been a, a considerable debate on linguaggio ampio. Uh, this is the teacher toolkit that Elena and I developed after we reviewed research on Italian and other similar languages. Um, and the toolkit, as you can see, identifies two main approaches to gender just language, feminization and neutralization. And we also have four main strategies, uh, which are similar to the ones that uh, Carlos discussed uh, before in relation to Portuguese. Uh, the first strategy is linked to feminization. So we want to make the feminine visible in a language where the masculine is dominant. So for example, we use both the feminine and the masculine form instead of just the overextended masculine. Uh, we also use the feminine form for prestigious, for prestigious professional titles, uh, in the feminine, uh, so it seems quite logic, but it's something that has met resistance for uh, male-dominated professions in Italian, where the, the masculine form uh, still remains uh, the preferred form. Uh, the, remain, the remaining three strategies um, are strategies of neutralization. So strategy two tells us to choose words that are the same for all genders. So for instance, gender neutral words like person or class instead of boys and girls. Uh, strategy three is based on rephrasing, so we change the sentence to eliminate gender references, so we use different strategies like passive forms, nominalizations, and so on. And the last strategy, as you can see, is about the use of linguistic innovations, uh, and it's the most controversial, so we use new symbols to replace uh, the gendered endings. So I'll now show you uh, the work that we've been doing in our university courses by applying the toolkit, um, and I'll start by talking about the beginner course uh, that I teach. And here I want to challenge the notion that many language teachers have that uh, introducing gender inclusive language in beginner language classes is impractical because students don't know enough about the language. And we believe that it's important that we talk about gender just language in beginner classes for two main reasons. Um, the first one is that in beginner classes, we often present rules like gender and agreement forms that will often stay with the learners uh, for the rest of the learning journey. So it's really important that we encourage them to critically evaluate these norms as they learn them, and also to reflect on the implications of the linguistic choices that they make from the very, very start. Um, it's also important to offer gender inclusive options in beginner classes because as the Australian li uh, linguist uh, uh, Tony Lidicut uh, said uh, more than a decade ago, much of the questioning focus in these classes is placed on the personal world of the learners. So uh, self-disclosure is particularly significant. We ask students to talk about themselves, to talk about their world, and yet there's resistance to offering them linguistic resources to enable them to fully express their identity. So the challenge that we obviously have as teachers uh, is to offer them gender-inclusive options that consider their very limited proficiency in the language. Um, and of course, you know, uh, we cannot expect them to use neutralization strategies like passive forms and nominalization uh, from the start. Uh, so here are some examples of how I integrated uh, gender just language into lessons plans in the first four weeks of my course. Of my course. Uh, in the first week, um, students learn about uh, subject pronouns in Italian. Uh, so we have a slide um, explaining how the non-binary they is translated into Italian with an example. So we have Edi Roma, um, which means he's from Rome, she's from Rome, or they gender neutral 
are from Rome. So um, Italian does not normally use um, a pronoun, um, a gender neutral pronoun. Uh, the verb is used uh, normally in the third person singular, even though you know, there are other proposals as well. Um, and uh, you can see that you know, the language required to understand and apply this rule is very simple. So we are telling the student, you know, if you use the third person singular, that could also mean uh, you know, the non-binary they. Uh, but uh, including this signals that us as teachers are taking a stance. We are opening the conversation. Um, it's also important that when we teach grammar, we avoid conflating the notion of grammatical gender and social gender. Uh, so in this slide, you can see that um, we tell students that grammatical gender and social gender are related. Um, but we also tell them that um, we also tell them that um, a binary grammatical system does not prevent linguistic expression of non-binary identities. So of course it complicates it, but it does not prevent it. And it, this is important for them to know. Um, so the message we convey is that Italian is not in here inherently exclusionary of non-binary identities as students might be led to believe. There are ways to go beyond the binary. So we emphasize to students that the primary function of grammatical gender is to make sure that agreement is reflected in words that depend on nouns. And we can change things in the sentence to make sure that grammatical agreement does not reflect the, the gender identity of the person speaking and being referred to um, you know, within this binary. So uh, in week three, students see this in practice uh, when we talk about adjective agreement. So uh, in Italian, the ending of, a, an, of an adjective normally gives us information about the gender of the speaker or the person being referred to. And in this teaching resource, uh, students can choose between uh, the masculine, the feminine, and the non-binary form. And if they choose the non-binary form, uh, they can add the gender neutral word persona, uh, as you can see. So the, the adjective uh, is in the feminine because it agrees with persona and not with the subject. And if they're writing, they can also use uh, innovative symbols uh, like the Italian gender neutral symbol schwa, uh, which is this um, upside down E. And um, I also allocate dedicated class time to discussions on gender justice. So for instance, in week four, uh, we examine the traditional presentation of words in dictionaries. Uh, in general, the masculine form is uh, um, normally considered the default option. So. For example, if students uh, look up the word for child in Italian, they would typically find bambino, uh, which specifically refers to a male child. And this practice is problematic, but um, it's often uncritically presented as the way things are. And from the start, we want to make sure that uh, these conventions um, are discussed. And here we tell them, for example, that some dictionaries um, are including both forms, so both the feminine and the masculine, and we ask them to reflect on why it's important. So the bottom line is that there's a lot that we can do uh, already from, from the beginning of uh, students' learning journeys to open linguistic spaces for them um, and also to have them reflect on linguistic norms and conventions. Um, we continue uh, the conversation also at higher level of um, Italian courses. I teach an intermediate level and uh, in this class um, I work towards moving the students from um, understanding the grammar structure that support the expression of identity, including the forms that Ricardo was um, presenting before. But also we uh, move the conversation on um, language use. So how do uh, the way we use the language changes uh, the way we express identities and the way we um, um, open opportunities for different ways, different genders. And finally, we uh, push the students to reflect on the impact of language use and also to make actions to decide consciously how they want to use the language. So uh, in the, the first step uh, is um, focusing on grammar, but um, at a deeper level, so we reflect on how it's not, as Ricardo said, the language that has an issue in using uh, feminine forms, for example. So the first step is on um, identifying feminization strategies, making sure that we make all gender visible, but um, masculine, feminine, but also non-binary. Um, and 
after we clarify the rules, we reflect on the fact that there are still um, issues in language use. Uh, for example, in these two pictures are two female uh, you know the the premier um, of our uh, country and one of the um, conductor of uh, an orchestra. They are both female, but they uh, declared publicly that they prefer to be addressed with a uh, masculine form of their uh, profession: il presidente, il direttore d'orchestra. Uh, so we move on to reflecting why this is happening. And for example, um, in uh, the next slide, you can see how we reflect on some processes, and some of them are hindering the use of more inclusive language and some other are pushing uh, forward. So the first one on top is uh, we reflect on why um, there is a lack of visibility for uh, feminine forms or non-binary forms. And one reason is uh, what we call asymmetrie linguistiche, an asymmetric use of the language in the masculine and feminine form, for example. If, uh, and this asymmetry can be in terms of prestige, for example, um, il um, direttore is more the masculine form, is more uh, a prestigious uh, role in a CEO uh, or um, high uh, level um, job where la direttrice, uh, which is the same, but in a feminine form, is usually referred to the principal of a school. So people tend to uh, use the masculine form, no matter what gender they identify with for this reason. But there are also, um, you know, um, we show also then that in the public space, there are challenges to these um, positions. And uh, for example, in, um, as um, Pio was saying, in the web space, we can see lots of examples of um, people that are using the schwa or they are using the asterisk when they want to neutralize gender and make their communication far more inclusive. And finally, um, we uh, reflect on everything um, and we come up with some ideas for um, action. For example, um, something that I was very uh, relating with uh, Pio's presentation is uh, we teach students and ourselves to not make assumptions, to be aware of diversity, to be conscious of the implication of our language use uh, and the impact that this is on our audience. And we do have a, a similar questionnaire where we ask students what pronoun they prefer to be addressed and we teach them to use these strategies also in their um, communications outside uh, the languages classroom. And, and this is something that um, we use to promote agency in the learning space, but also in the user uh, use of the language. And um, finally, uh, we wanted to conclude by talking about our advocacy efforts and research agenda. Um, so as part of our advocacy for gender just language, we offer seminars, workshops um, to engage with teachers. And, and our key message is that integrating inclusive language into the teaching practices is not something that they should do on top of the prescribed content, but something that can be integrated into what they are already doing in the classroom. So starting for the, from the curriculum could be a way for them to respond also to any resistance that they might face when implementing inclusive language. And their goal is to expand linguistic options, open linguistic spaces without limiting them. And this year, we're also conducting an action research project in collaboration with the teaching association. So we work closely with um, a group of teachers over, over time to pinpoint challenges that they face for implementing gender just language. And we provide ongoing support to develop and assess strategies aimed at overcoming these challenges. And uh, our research agenda includes a mixed method study to examine current practices related to the implementation of uh, uh, gender just language in Australian schools. Um, and through this study, we aim to identify the ad hoc strategies that teachers um, are already uh, adopting in this uh, evolving landscape, the challenges that they encounter and the specific needs uh, that teachers have uh, in effectively implementing uh, inclusive language practices. Thank you very much. That's all for us today. Thank you both so much. That was wonderful. Um, our very last, but definitely not the least presentation is going to be on challenging frameworks with teaching gender inclusive English in France by Veronique Perry. Please. Go ahead and share. So I'm sharing. Can you see? 
Yes. Okay. I forgot to... Okay, sorry. So I'm going also to explain uh, what's happening in France. So I am... Uh, I teach at the uh, University of Science and Technology uh, in Toulouse, uh, southwestern France. And I'm an EFL teacher and researcher, but also for the university, I'm a member of the Social Administration Committee and the advisor for the fight against discrimination, harassment, and sexual and sexist violence for, for the university. And we, we have 300... Uh, no... <laughs> 36,000 uh, students enrolled in uh, the at the university and 6,000 6, uh, employees. So it's a very big university. Toulouse is the second uh, place for, for, for academic studies in, in France. So I'm going to expand on... Uh, uh, where we come from, okay? So in, in France, I'm teaching English to French speakers, whether they are uh, native speakers of, of uh, French or uh, French as a second language, because we have a lot of people coming from Morocco, Algeria, and uh, African countries, uh, ex-colonies. So, uh, as a French student, uh, as a French speaker, supposedly native uh, French speaker, in fact, uh, I was made monolingual because of the French centralized language policy. And uh, so normally uh, speakers in France should speak two languages at least, but uh, we were gradually deprived of that skills because of uh, French being, being imposed as the, the national language, and in, it, it's in the constitution. So, uh, uh, it's not about, uh, when I started my research about gender in language teaching, all I could say was that there was something about gender beyond binary thinking and the oppositions uh, like new uh, and that, uh, Terms like neuter and common were, were were at stake, were the issues in French. So it was not simply about linguistic, it was also about personal freedom and teaching languages and cultures without imposing a normative and ethnocentric view of gender. So here is was what the, the following words meant to me and why I escaped into English and why my research is about deconstructing binary thinking through the teaching of English. Uh, so masculine and feminine are items that class classified noun required agreement, just like in Italian, but in Italian and Portuguese, you have other opportunities to deconstruct uh, gender binary thinking with uh, different uh, sounds and we don't. That's what is different between Spanish, Portuguese, Italian and French. Um, so, uh, gender was stamped everywhere in the French language, and it was called, just like for your languages, grammatical gender. We have a French academy, we call that Académie Française, um, built by a, a Catholic called Richelieu, and he said, in, he ordered uh, French grammarians in 1647 to, to have the masculine gender uh, because more noble, just like French um, male, uh, French, I mean, uh, men in France were supposed to be uh, more uh, more noble, and he 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 really um, anchored the the male domination into the French system, which was not regulated the same way before. So uh, we have the imposition of this rule. Uh, masculine and feminine could also be used to talk about humans as, his, as synonymous items to replace man or woman. But uh, if masculine uh, was used for a woman and feminine used for a man, it was considered an homophobic insult. 
Uh, we use also masculine for animal species, object, and arb arbitrary rules are very numerous. Neuter and common, we don't we don't know what it is. Okay, so there is nothing uh, we can do beyond the binary structure. There's been an attempt in France um, to offer a, a pronoun uh, yell, which is a, a mixture of il and el, but it was literally forbidden to use it. So um, everything felt like a trap, you know, when I was growing up as, as a French uh, person in France, a French person from Southern France, where we used to speak Occitan, okay? Uh, and uh, it's not a dialect, it's a, it's a language. French was a dialect spoken only in pa around Paris, historically. So, um, in October 2023, uh, the, edu the educational integration of gender awareness in France has experienced a new challenge. Some recent authoritarian abuses, um, wait, I'm going to show you a slide, uh, I'm lost. Uh -oh. What can you see? Can you see the full? We can see the first slide. Yes, but I, I'm going to, I want to show the second one. There you go. Now we can see it. Okay. But you can see also everything around it, can't you? Yes. If you um have it, I think it's that um full screen it would be just one i think it is i don't remember where full screen can you see where i read also or not um yes a little bit we we see the notes section a little bit i think where was the full screen i think it's uh you see on the bottom of your page there is a one right i think that should go full screen doesn't work. Oh. Anyway, can you see positive thinking here? Yes. The situation in France, backlash going backwards? Yes. Okay. So they need to calm down, but they don't, you know? So I have lost. So here you can see everything, in fact. So I should put this the other way. What can you see now? We can see the second slide. You you can? Yes. It's not full screen, but we can see the slide. I'm lost. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Can you see what I'm reading? Can you see the text or not? We can see the situation in France backlash going backwards. Okay. With... Okay. okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, no scientific work in linguistics seems to be enough when facing the displayed omnipotence of the rulers, the monarchs or wannabe monarchs, who have wanted for centuries in France to govern the use of gender categorization in order to make it a tool for absolutist propaganda. In other words, this, the, this queer other, the potential alternate model in ourselves, who is a sovereign subject, cannot be the subject of, of permanent reconfiguration uh, because of what is happening uh, through uh, the use of French uh, in France, specifically when the government uh, forbids the use of gender inclusivity. So, Gender creativity offends and endangers law and order in France, you know? So it's, we have no way to escape. Can you see French versus English? Yes. Okay, so that's the situation for French. We have the maximum number of constraints. And in English, since you have a pronomital type, prono uh, you have a, a minimum uh, constraints of gender. So that's why I, I started uh, implementing a gender fair, gender inclusive, gender free uh, teaching of English. 
based also on queer values uh, to uh, enhance non-binary representations of gender, uh, which help us make a link be between uh, co cosmogonical myths and and beings that are considered um, uh, as a, as a positive figures, even if they are neither men nor women. And it's also uh, based on a decolonial um, instruction of language and cultures. Um, I can pass on uh, everything I, I know about uh, the history of South Africa, Canada, and Australia, New Zealand, because I, I had civilization civilization courses denouncing the horrors of former colonies of the British empires, countries finding themselves today uh, through the Commonwealth. And you know that the Brexit in Europe uh, was, a, was a tragedy and it's still a tragedy because we cannot have a easy exchange, uh, you know, academic exchanges and academic uh, flow between Erasmus students cannot come to to France anymore, for example, or travel in Europe because of the Brexit. So now you have this unity of the Commonwealth uh, plus the US and, and you know that Europe is at war and that the, the French government is uh, taking a lot of risks. The French president is having, uh, so we are, uh, we are worried about what's happening. So promoting um, unity, love and understanding through the teaching of foreign languages is key to this uh, culture of the peace, as we heard for, from the United Nations this morning. So uh, comport, co the, the fact that we have a dis disciplinary approaches in France and it's, we don't have any gender studies also uh, reduces the problem uh, of gender uh, to, for example, li linguistics or sociology whether, while it's a dynamic link with uh, identity representation and social reform um, that we, we, need, we need to consider. If we break down barriers, we make a radical paradigmatic change. All the parameters of communication are articulated, embedded into the emotional body, transforming the mind. Gender is then integrated transversally into all the parameters of the interaction. We are not only in the guidance of languages in contact, but in the cathartic theatrical, th theatrical performance of another self, vibrating with other frequencies in role plays in this ideally reflexive, reflexive performativity of, living, of the living speech through the appropriation of these speech acts that we have um, in other languages. That's why emancipation is for me is the identification of one's own linguistic cultural limits in order to get around and, and over them, make them fly away, then probably fall back, but powerless. And, and then have, we have the ability to go beyond and over them. A language class may be regarded as a world of utopia and an artificially constructed micro, microcosm where individuals have to express themselves within a group with a co coherent and adapted speech. In other words, the speech has to be faithful to what one has to express using an adapted lexicon shared by all. It might then also be an experimental place to teach people how to deal with the creation of a personal myth outside of a closet, a place where individuals could recognize themselves as part of a society where they can name themselves and be properly identified. This process goes beyond nostalgia and folklore. It deals with the deconstruction of gender stereotypes through the appropriation of new gender values in a privileged community of practice. This again could be called performativity or a myth-making aiming at changing representation. As a result, the representation of gender cultural diversity in language teaching programs in France depends on the will to recognize that gender is a cultural variable intertwined with sociolinguistic variables. The binary vision of the French language, language should be understood as a symbolic 
public violence based on implicit, implicitly forced heteronormativity without respect of queer forms of sexuality and multiple gender identity. That's why I've started designing a model to show language teachers in France in English as a foreign language, but I'm meeting a lot of resistance. I mean, people resist this approach uh, to implement gender as a reflexive concept through its various aspects. Uh, this praxeology is based on the implementation, as I told you, of uh, University of Practice and relying also on uh, the European framework that we all depend on, that uh, offers and entices us beyond uh, national uh, programs to uh, advocate for uh, social inclusion, dialogue and democracy. So uh, to compensate the lack of resources and the is issues uh, implied by overcrowded classrooms, sometimes I have up to 36 students in my classes, I design a hybrid system where students work with each other and above all help each other because I implement a praxeological way to pass on all the values that I talked to you about. Uh, I ask my students in my staff classes, uh, so it's five years after high school diploma, to choose a project in their field of study and build a community of praxis, agree on objectives and pick up a, and uh, find a way to support one another. Cooperation is fundamental for self-confidence to know that your peers are there to support you if you stumble. We therefore work on engaging societal aspects, enticing topics through professional situations in the English speaking world, following an active methodology based on the strengthening of intercorrection between peers and formative evaluation, meaning uh, evaluating progress, takes precedence over summative evaluation, giving a grade. One of the most telling examples is a project imagined by, by a peer of master students working in artificial intelligence. It was just after the big fires in Australia and they wanted to start, uh, we have people in Australia here, they, want, they wanted to start what they called the Koala project whose goal was to try to computer model alerts to, serve, to save animals and humans. It was based on First Nation bushfire monitoring techniques. We could therefore rely on the ancestral knowledge of the First Nations. They worked on the history of Australia, on the living conditions of the First Nations today, and then by chance they came across a researcher in Australia who is doing the same thing as them. I helped them write an email and in that case, the project, which is a fict fictive project, is transformed because we go from the English class to real life. And the student, one of the students got, got a scholarship, a scholarship, sorry, thanks to me for a doctoral research program at the Univers University of Toulouse. So this project to me is the model. It is concrete. It sets up value. It promotes a young woman in a promising field, artificial intelligence for the University of Toulouse. So raising intersectional awareness means that gender intersect with other stigmas to fight like homophobia, racism, Islamophobia. And we, and we can still imagine professional scenarios in their field of study. Students ask themselves all these questions and these societal questions being articulated with the scientific technical aspect in their field of specialty. My, uh, my goal is in particular to have them brainstorm in English before meeting the person who will finance the project. They must write down their questions, their research. The entire course of the semester is based on their online doc documentary research. And we call, call that a, a web quest. They use online tools to online tools to build interactions, find, find vocabulary, so there is no frustration. That's what we call embedded learning teaching. Uh, that are, there are also scenarios that are imagined depending on what they want to work on in, in their areas of study and about their concerns. Uh, I also have a lot of students working on applications because they work in embedded systems. So uh, I was a a member of a feminist uh, research project with 27 European countries. 
uh, 10 years ago. And I became friends with a Maltese researcher. And you have to know that Malta is a former, former British colony and therefore their second language is English. It is also a country where abortion is prohibited. One year for the project, for the project they had to think about, a group thought of a, an application they could build to allow people who want to have an abortion to be in a network uh, to go and have an abortion elsewhere in Europe. So that's also a way to empower people to articulate the um, advance in technology and social awareness. Another example, uh, when Trump, Trump was in power and I pray for him not to come back, Iranians were banned from entering the United States. And I had an Algerian student who was very angry, didn't want to learn English because of this colonial impact of English as a foreign language. And uh, then uh, finally his group, uh, the, the, the work group he was working on, imagine an application to help people who are stigmatized because of their nationality in the United States. And then he was very happy to learn English. And the fact that he was involved in the project helped him a lot to to be to empower himself um, as a Muslim in this case. So uh, unfortunately, I have a lot of uh, colleagues resisting these approaches in my university. Um, I call that intercultural awareness. Um, so my goal is the promotion of language studies through the promotion of gender and in intersectional awareness. Uh, we study a lot of uh, technical vocabulary. Uh, I'm not putting aside the pro pro professional goals, but I try to empower them uh, to fight against uh, any type of uh, oppression and get up, stand up against uh, any type of stigma. Thank you for listening. <laughs>